Hi, I'm Randy Appel and I'm your Regents tutor. And in this lesson, you're going to learn everything you need to know about kinetics and equilibrium. So let's first start with kinetics. Kinetics represents how fast a reaction happens, or the rate of a reaction. The first thing you need to understand about a reaction rate, or what controls the rate of the reaction, is the collision theory. The collision theory states that any chemical reaction, in order for it to occur, must have collisions between the particles. For example, let's say we wanted to make water. We'd have to take hydrogen and oxygen. Let's say this represented hydrogen and this represented an oxygen molecule. If I have this molecule, hydrogen and oxygen here, what's going to happen? You're not going to make water. The only way for water to be water is hydrogen and oxygen have to come together. The collisions also have to be effective. So you see these smiley faces here? Let's say that they have to actually touch in order, for this, in order for water to form. So if I go like this, that's not an effective collision. But this represents an effective collision. Collision theory states that in order for a reaction to occur, there must be effective collisions between particles. Now we have to talk about factors that affect the reaction rate. And the first factor that affects the rate of a reaction is the nature, or the bond type, of a substance. And what you need to understand with this is ionic substances react faster than covalent substances. That's it. Ionically bonded substances react faster than covalent. Now you can look up the concept ionic, bonded, ionic bonding and, and covalent bonding to learn more about this or to refresh your memory, but you need to understand ionic substances react faster than covalent substances. The next thing, concentration. What happens if I increase the concentration or I add more particles? Well, if I add more particles, what's going to happen to the amount of collisions? If I have more of these potentially colliding, then the collisions will increase, and therefore the reaction rate will increase. So with concentration, as you increase the concentration of the particles, you increase the reaction rate. The next thing is pressure. Remember, in chemistry, pressure only affects gases. So if you increase the pressure on a solid and liquid, it will have no effect. But if you increase the concentration on a gas, um, excuse me, if you increase the pressure on a gas, what happens when you increase the pressure? The particles get closer and closer together. If they get closer together, what happens to the amount of collisions? They increase. And if you increase the collisions, you increase the reaction rate. Next one, temperature. How does temperature affect the reaction rate? Well, if you increase temperature, remember what temperature is? Average kinetic energy. So if you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy, so you increase the movement of the particles. If the particles are moving faster, then there's a greater chance that they're going to collide. If there's a greater chance that they're going to collide, the reaction rate increases. So if you increase temperature, you increase reaction rate. Next one, surface area. Surface area represents the amount of area a substance takes up. If you have a cube of sugar, or a packet of sugar, let's say you have the same amount, same grams of each, 10 grams of a cube of sugar or 10 grams of a packet of sugar? Which is going to take up more surface area? Well, if I drop the cube in water, it's just going to be in a set area. But if I drop the powder in water, it's going to go throughout the whole entire substance. The greater the surface area, the more chance there are of collisions, therefore, the greater the reaction rate. So a powdered substance would be better than a solid cube of a substance. Increased surface area, increased reaction rate. And the last thing you need to know is what a catalyst is. A catalyst, by definition, is any substance that speeds up the rate of a reaction. So what does a catalyst do? Obviously, a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction. The way it does it is it does it by creating an alternate pathway for the reaction to occur. I don't know if you guys remember biology, but in biology, you learned about enzymes. Enzymes were responsible for how reactions occur. They're they responsible for how you digest your food and other reactions. Enzymes were catalysts. Catalyst speeds up the rate of a reaction by creating an alternate pathway for a reaction to occur. Another thing a catalyst does, which you're going to learn about in a little bit later on in the lesson, is it lowers the activation energy. So a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction by lowering the activation energy and creating an alternate pathway for the reaction to occur. Before you understand the next thing we're going to go over, I need to teach you about a reversible reaction. A reversible reaction is a reaction that can go both ways. 
Let's say you want to make water. You take hydrogen and oxygen and you produce water. But then that water that you're producing, that water can then start to break down. It can break down into hydrogen and oxygen. And now you have a reversible reaction where the reactants are producing the products, but also the products then break down to produce the reactants. So a reversible reaction is a reaction that can go both ways. Understanding that will help you understand the rest of what we're going to talk about. The next thing we have to talk about are potential energy diagrams. Now you see an example of a potential energy diagram on your, on your screen to the left. A potential energy diagram shows the energy throughout a reaction. So while a reaction occurs, you start with a certain amount of energy, during the reaction there's a certain amount, and then you end up with some energy at the end. Sometimes it can be more than you started with, sometimes it can be less than you started with. You have to understand the terms before I can even tell you what the potential energy diagram shows. The first thing, the potential energy of the reactants. Well, the reactants are what you start with, and each reactant has its own energy. So the potential energy of the reactants is the energy of the, that you start with in the substances that you're starting with. And the potential energy of the products is therefore the energy in the substances you end up with. So let's say the reactants are down here. This is how much energy you have in the reactants. And then up here, you have this much energy in the products. That means you gained energy. Let's say you have this much energy to start with in the reactants, and then you end up with this much energy. That means you lost energy. The amount of energy gained or lost represents the heat of the reaction, the delta H. The delta H represents the heat of a reaction. Another thing you need to understand is the activation energy. Activation energy is the minimum amount of energy needed to start a reaction. So here I have a box of matches. Now, in order for this reaction to work, actually to light the match, I have to supply enough energy here. What if I go like this? Did I get a reaction? No, because I didn't supply enough energy. I didn't supply the activation energy to light this match. How about now? No. The reason why this flame, I just was able to light this match and see this flame, is because I supplied enough energy to start the reaction. And that energy is the activation energy. The activated complex represents the maximum amount of energy you have during the reaction. And you'll see more of that in the diagram. Okay, now you have to understand the potential energy diagram labeled. So you see a reaction here. Notice that you start, where you, the reaction starts, it's lower than where it ends up. That means you gained energy. And now you have to see what everything is. A represents the potential energy of the reactants. Because remember, this is where you start with. The reactants are where you start. B represents the potential energy of the products. That's the substance you end up with. Notice, the reactants have 10 joules of energy, and the products have 40 joules of energy. So C, the heat of the reaction, represents the difference between what you start with and what you end up with. If you start with 10 joules of energy and end up with 40, then you therefore gained 30 joules of energy. So the delta H is a positive 30 joules because you gained 30 joules. The activation energy is the point from the reactants all the way to the top because that represents the energy you needed to start the reaction. So the activation energy goes from the, the reactants up to the top. And that top, and that's C, and that's D, excuse me. E represents the activated complex, the point at the very top of the diagram to the bottom. So the total amount of energy of this system. And the last thing you may need to know, sometimes the Regents ask about this, although they never have, but it's, it's important that you understand it, so I'm just going to teach it to you. Letter F represents, in a reversible reaction, Remember, then the products, and if it's reversing, the products are then the reactants. So letter F represents the activation energy for the reverse reaction. You just have to remember and understand the labeled potential energy diagram as shown here. You have to know what each letter represents and you have to know what each letter means. And again, this was an endothermic reaction. Potential energy diagrams could be exothermic. And now we're going to talk about that. Let's, let's see an exothermic potential energy diagram. So now on your slide, you see an exothermic B 
because you start with a certain amount of energy. In this case, you start with 40 joules of energy, but your products have 10 joules of energy. So you actually lost 30 joules of energy. That means energy was released. That's exothermic. Therefore, the delta H, the heat of the reaction, is negative 30. So in an endothermic reaction, the products have more energy than the reactants. In an exothermic reaction, the reactants have more, have more energy than the products. OK. What happens when you add a catalyst? Well, let's take this endothermic potential energy diagram. When you add a catalyst, you know it speeds up the reaction. How does it speed up a reaction? It speeds it up by creating an alternate pathway that actually lowers the activation energy. So if I wanted to look on this screen and show you how to draw a new potential energy diagram with the addition of a catalyst, what I would do is, in a, in a, with a catalyst, you start and end at the exact same point. So the energy of the reactants is the same, the energy of the, of the products are the same, which means the delta H is the same. What changes, though, is the activation energy. So the activation energy, as you can see here, gets lowered. So what changes in it when a catalyst is added? Activation energy gets lowered, the activated complex gets lowered, and then the reverse activation energy gets lowered. What remains the same when a catalyst is added? Potential energy of the reactants, potential energy of the products, and therefore the delta H, or the heat of the reaction. And that's what happens when you add a catalyst. The next thing I want to talk about is over the periodic table I. Table I is a pr relatively easy periodic table to understand. And if you look at table I, it represents certain reactions, and it tells you the delta H. And this represents how much energy is gained or lost in a reaction. Now, do you have to remember that a negative delta H is exothermic and a positive delta H is endothermic? Well, you should, but you don't have to. Because if you look closely at the table I at the very bottom, it says something right here that will help you understand everything. It says that a minus sign, which is negative, a minus sign indicates an exothermic reaction. So you now know if it's a negative delta H, it's an exothermic reaction. So sometimes they say, you know, when water is formed from its, from its elements, so like H2O gas, for example, is formed from its elements, hydrogen and oxygen, what kind of reaction is that? Well, you know it, it's negative 483.6, which means it's releasing energy, it's exothermic, and it's releasing 483.6 joules of energy. Well, in this case, it's kilojoules. And sometimes they ask math problems, where they say you have two, water, two hydrogen molecules plus an oxygen, two hydrogen molecules plus one oxygen molecule produces two, hyd, two water molecules of gas. And remember how to designate endothermic and exothermic reactions. If it's exothermic, the, the energy term is on your right. So how would I draw the reaction with water, with 571.6 joules of water? I would have to write two H2s plus O2 yields two H2O. And since it's exothermic, I'd have to put the energy on the right plus 571.6. And you can see this on your video screen. It shows the reaction. What if they said, what is the delta H for this reaction? Well, you would say, wait a minute. OK, so I have 571.6 kilojoules of energy. It's on the right side, so I know it's releasing energy. Oh, it's negative 571.6 kilojoules. Another thing they could say in this exact reaction is, what is the heat of formation for one mole of water? Well, you see in this reaction, there are two moles of water that releases 571.6 kilojoules. So if they ask for the heat of formation of one mole, the amount of the heat of formation is negative 285.8 kilojoules, which is just half. So for two moles, it releases 571.6. For one mole, it releases half, which is 285.8. OK. The next thing we need to talk about is equilibrium. Equilibrium, for some reason, gives some students a lot of trouble. But if you just think about it in the terms that I'm going to explain to you, it's actually quite simple. Equilibrium means, you hear the word equal in equilibrium. What is equal in an equilibrium? This is what students confuse. 
in an equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the reverse. So remember I talked about reversible reactions. If I'm drawing a reaction, 2H2 gas plus O2 gas produces 2H2O gas. And I'm going to leave the energy term out for now because it's not as relevant right now. So the forward reaction is hydrogen and oxygen producing water. But remember, I told you sometimes the water could break down into hydrogen and oxygen. These two arrows here indicate an equilibrium in which the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. Now, when can an equilibrium happen? An equilibrium can only happen in a closed system. Closed system just literally means a closed system. If I had a flask here and I had hydrogen and oxygen producing water, what would happen to the water that's produced? The water would leave the system. But if I closed the system and didn't let anything out, then all that water that was building up would eventually start to form back into hydrogen and oxygen. And the equilibrium would be when the rates of the forward reaction and the rates of the reverse reaction are equal. So it's the rates that are equal. When you see equilibrium, you think rates are equal. Well, what about the concentrations? The amount? Well, the amount does not necessarily have to be equal. And that's where the Regents tries to trick you. It's not the concentrations that are equal. But what do you have to know about the concentrations? In an equilibrium, since the rates are equal, the concentrations remain constant. If the rates are going back and forth in the same direction, you're not producing any more or less of the reactants so, or products. So what you have to know with an equilibrium is the rates are equal and the concentrations remain constant or they don't change. What kind of substances can undergo equilibrium? Well, the first kind, uh, what kind of equilibrium can you have? Physical and chemical. Here's an example of a chemical equilibrium. Why? Because it's, remember, and you can refer back to the concept on chemical and physical changes, this is a chemical change because you're actually producing a new substance. So this represents a chemical change. And in chemical changes can undergo equilibrium. How about physical change? Sure. Let's say I have water and I want to do a phase equilibrium. A phase equilibrium is an equilibrium between two phases. Let's say I have liquid and liquid's becoming a gas. And I close the system, so the gas can't escape, the gas is going to eventually condense back into the liquid. Boiling, condensing. The rate at which the liquid boils is equal to the rate at which the gas condenses. And what temperature would this be for water? Well, this is the boiling point, 100 degrees. If I had solid and liquid here, I can have the same thing. It would just be a solid liquid equilibrium. And what temperature would that be? Zero degrees Celsius. And you can refer back to the heating curves where we talked about liquid gas equilibriums and solid liquid equilibriums because it relates now and you'll probably have a better understanding of what that means. The only other kind of physical equilibrium you need to know about is a solution equilibrium. A solution equilibrium is when Remember what a solution is, and you can go to the concept. A solute dissolves in a solvent, and remember, it's dissolving. So a solution equilibrium is when the rate of dissolving a substance is equal to the rate at which that substance is then recrystallizes. So if you have NaCl and you drop it in water, NaCl as a solid equilibrium would look like this. And sometimes I don't have to write the full arrows. I could just write half arrows. But it, when, you, when you put it in water, you get Na plus ion, and it's Aq, and Cl minus ion, and it's Aq. This represents a, a solution equilibrium. The rate at which it dissolves is equal to the rate at which it crystallizes. And one thing you need to understand and be very clear with solution equilibriums, it can only happen for saturated solutions. It can only happen for saturated solutions. Solution equilibriums, saturated solutions. Now we've got to talk about something called Le Chatelier's Principle. 
Now, Le Chatelier is just a guy who came up with a principle. The name sounds confusing, and a lot of students have some trouble with this, so we're going to try to make it real simple for you. I'm going to draw a reaction on the board. I'm going to draw a chemical equilibrium. I'm going to take nitrogen gas. I'm going to add hydrogen gas. I'm going to show it at equilibrium to produce two moles of NH3 gas and some energy. Here's a reaction. This is an equilibrium. It's a chemical equilibrium because you're changing. What Le Chatelier said was that sometimes if you put a stress on an equilibrium, it can mess up the equilibrium. Right? This is an equilibrium. What kind of stresses did he talk about? He talked about changes in concentration, changes in pressure, and changes in temperature. Now remember, those things all affect the rate of a reaction. So if we change those conditions, this equilibrium is going to get messed up. But what Le Chatelier said, and what you need to understand, is that if a stress is added, it's okay because the equilibrium will correct itself by either shifting to the left or shifting to the right. And very important thing you need to understand, if an equilibrium shifts to the left, everything on the left side of the equation increases and everything on the right side decreases. If an equilibrium shifts to the right, everything on the right side increases and everything on the left side decreases. So how do we talk about stresses? Let's talk about concentration. If you change the concentration, let's say you add more N2. You're adding more N2. Well, think about it in terms of the collision theory. If N2 increases, what's going to happen to the reaction between these two? They're going to increase because there's more effective collisions. When these increase, they're going to get used up because they're producing NH3. But what you have to understand is when you increase the concentration of anything on a certain side, it shifts away from that side. So, so it's really important if you can think of it, you could separate by the arrow right here. And you can think about the two sides. If you increase something on this side, so let's say you increase the N2, well then this side, the equilibrium to correct itself, there's now too much on this side. So the equilibrium is going to shift to the right. So everything on the left goes down and everything on the right goes up. Let's say you decreased the amount of water. Um, excuse me, the amount of hydrogen. If you decrease the amount of hydrogen, now there's too little on this side. So to correct for that, the equilibrium will shift to this side. And if it shifts to this side, everything on this side goes up, everything on this side goes down. That's concentration. Let's say we're talking about pressure. A couple of things you have to know about pressure. First of all, pressure only affects gases. Pressure only affects gases, which you know. So when you increase the pressure, if there are gases, it'll work. And the rule for pr increasing pressure is if you increase pressure, it shifts to the side with the least number of moles. Now you have to keep this, something students find a little tricky. When you're increasing pressure, you're actually increasing pressure on the whole system. You're not increasing the pressure on one side or the pressure on another side. You're increasing pressure on the whole system. So when you increase pressure, it shifts to the side with the least number of moles. The coefficient represents the moles. There's one mole here, three moles here. So on this whole side, there are four moles. On this whole side, there are two moles. So when you increase pressure, it's going to shift to the right. So the amount of NH3 moles will go up, the amount of H2 and N2 will go down. And that's the effect of pressure. What if there are equal number of moles of, of, on both sides? Then pressure will have no effect. And if you decrease pressure, it does the opposite. So the way, I, the way we always tell you at Regents Tutor to do this is, if you increase pressure, it shifts to the side with the least number of moles. If you decrease pressure, just do the exact opposite. It shifts to the side with the most number of moles. The last thing is temperature. How does temperature affect it? Now, the rule you need to understand is when you increase the temperature, temperature increases the reaction. But it favors the endothermic direction. Now, remember, 
if the energy is on the right, rex, this is the exothermic direction. Therefore, this represents the endothermic direction. But I don't even want you to learn, think of it that way. You need to understand that if you increase temperature, it favors the endothermic direction. But the way I want you to do it, and the way at Regents Tutor we teach you how to do it, which makes it real simple, if you increase temperature, which is kinetic energy, whichever side has the energy, now has too much energy, so it's like concentration, it shifts away from it. So if you increase temperature, it always shifts away from the side with the energy. So in this reaction, if you increase temperature, this is the energy, it's going to shift to the left. Everything on this side is going to go up, everything on this side is going to go down. And if you decrease temperature, it's the exact opposite. There's not enough energy, so it's going to shift to the right. And you're going to work out some problems on this, and you're going to do them over and over again, but understanding Le Chatelier's principle will guarantee you a couple of points on the regions. And I have one sample question I want to go over. On my screen you see, let's say you have nitrogen and oxygen plus energy produces two nitrogen oxide. What will change, which, which change will result in a decrease in the amount of NO? So you want to decrease the amount of NO. Well, let's go through the four answer choices. If you decrease the pressure, well, there's two moles on the left side and two moles on the right side. So that will have no effect. That will not affect the number of NO, moles of NO. How about decreasing the concentration of N2? If you decrease N2, now there's too little on the left, so it's going to shift to the left, which will actually decrease the amount of NO, which is your answer. And let's talk about some of the other ones. If you increase the concentration of O2, there's now too much on the left, so it's going to shift to the right, which will increase the amount of NO. If you increase the temperature, where's the energy? The energy's on the left, so it's going to shift away from it to the right, so that will also increase the NO. And that's Le Chatelier. And the last thing we have to do in this topic is entropy. Entropy is the easiest thing in chemistry, but students have a problem with it sometimes because of the wording. It's entropy. Nobody even knows what that means. You need to know entropy is disorder or randomness. If your room right now has a lot of entropy, it's really messy. If your room is very clean and not disorderly and neat and organized, it has very low entropy. Entropy just means randomness or disorder. And the main thing you need to know about entropy is how entropy changes from phase to phase. Which phase do you think has the most entropy? It makes sense, gas particles, the gas phase, because the particles are all over the place. So the gas phase will have the most entropy. What will have the least entropy? Well, the solids are very close together. So of course, solids would have least entropy. And liquids, or aqueous solutions, would have somewhere in the middle. So in entropy increases as you go from solids to liquids to gases. And the last thing they teach you about entropy, and it, it actually involves energy as well, they say something like this, and you just need to memorize this. This is a memorization thing. It's on your Regents Tutor Review Sheet, so just look at it, or just memorize it now. Systems in nature, systems in nature tend to undergo changes that towards, or that result, in a higher entropy and lower energy. So it's easier for reactions to increase their entropy, more towards a gas, and decrease the energy, release energy. You just need to know systems in nature tend to undergo changes towards a higher entropy and lower energy. So I hope you learned a lot about kinetics and equilibrium. We went through a lot of stuff, but before you think you know everything you need to know about kinetics and equilibrium, you must go over all the questions that relate to the lesson on kinetics and equilibrium. And even if you think you know the answer, I want you to listen to the video explanations for every single answer. I also want you to ask questions in chat. If you're still confused, ask questions in chat. Use your Regents Tutor Review Sheet to go over all the concepts that you really need to understand with kinetics and equilibrium, just to make sure you understand it. And that's pretty much all you need to know. What we went over is everything you need to know. Make sure you listen to what I said. Go over your questions. Go over your Regents Tutor Review Sheet. And if you still have questions, go over the chat. Hope you learned a lot.